All right, welcome to church, everybody. Glad that you're here. My name's Jesse, and it's to journey right alongside of all of you. And as we open up God's word, listen, if you're new or newer with us, a special welcome to you. Uh, we love you, even if we haven't met you yet. And we just want you to, to feel connected and included right along with us in this community. And one of the ways that you can follow along in today's message is, is you can use that connect card in front of you, which that's where you'll put a prayer request or If you make a a commitment to Jesus, that's a great way to get connected through that. But also there's a QR code on there. You can open your camera, scan that QR code, takes it, takes you to our link tree where you can get our message notes, right? There's a bunch of helpful links on there, but also our our message notes are right there. I want you to be able to follow along and you'll even be able to get to see where I'm going before I get there. You kind of get a glimpse into and try to figure out what all the dots that I'm trying to connect up here, all right? And so maybe it'll help it be a little more clear to you as I go through. So, beautiful day today, and we are in following Jesus message series where we've been looking at these past couple of weeks, what does it look like to be a Christ follower? I mean, we started with our our leader, Jesus, and we're gonna swing back to that here in the next couple of weeks, but we're also talking about what does it look like, not just as a, a leader, Jesus, but who he is, but who are we as followers of Jesus, especially in this time, right? In October of 2024, in November of 2024, and during an election year, an election cycle, and issues all over the place, right? But coming out of Colossians 2.6, it says this, and just as you accepted Christ Jesus as your Lord, you must continue to follow him. Like, this is something that, that we've got to do daily. This is something that it's not just like a decision that we make, but it's decisions that we make. Each and every day, we decide to be followers of Jesus, and we must continue, no matter the opposition or how hard it is, we got to continue to follow Jesus. There's a, a game that we play with my kids, and, and we have a golf cart And we all pile on this golf cart, right? Like the whole family piles on the golf cart. And and we close our eyes. Uh, The driver does not close their eyes, all right? So just to be clear, there's rules to this game. So whoever's driving, they have to keep their eyes open. But the passengers close their eyes. And we drive all around, you know, we do circles and we go up and we go down. We drive all crazy and everywhere and kids fall out because their eyes are closed. They're not holding on, whatever. But then we stop. And, And the passenger has to identify where they are after driving all around, right? And I said, all right, the house is over there. I think the driveway is over there. I think the, the tree with a swing in it is over here, right? And, and they've got to try to, after being disoriented, they have to try to see where they are, right? But what we all know is it's pretty hard to navigate if we can't see. It's pretty hard to navigate if your eyes are closed or if you're blind. And so today I want to talk about how Jesus sees, and hopefully that we can see what Jesus sees. When we start to follow Jesus, one of the first things that he does, he starts to work on our lives, right? He, when we follow Jesus, then we start to change. Like He, he, he starts to change us, and because we say, God, it's not, not the way that I want to live. It's the way that you want me to live, and, and so he, he starts to to transform us and he starts to change us and and to be more like Christ, to be more like him. And one of the first things that he does, he starts doing eye surgery, right? He starts changing the way that we see. We start seeing things differently. We start seeing a situation differently. We start seeing people differently. We start seeing relationships differently. We start seeing differently. And, And there's a story In Luke chapter 19, if you have your Bible, open up to Luke chapter 19, and I want to read through this together. If you have a Bible, open it up. If you want to pull the Bible out on your phone, you can get that. If you don't have a Bible app on your phone, there's a great thing called the YouVersion app. You can get that and follow along through that. Uh, But let's read through this together, the story. It's only four verses, but I think it gives us a pretty accurate glimpse of Jesus and the heart of Jesus by what he sees. It says this, verse 41 of chapter 19. But as he came closer to Jerusalem and saw the city ahead. All right, so it's believed that he's probably in Bethany, which is about two miles up the mountain. And he comes down this mountain and he starts to see Jerusalem. And he can see kind of the, from a bird's eye view, the city of Jerusalem. And he saw the city ahead. And he just began to weep. He just sees the city. 
he's coming down this mountain and he, he looks out and he sees the city, he just starts crying. And not just crying, like he is weeping over the city and then he laments, he just cries out, man, how I wish today that you of all people, I mean, this was supposed to be like God's city. These are God's people. And he's just weeping over this, like I wish that you of all people would understand the way to peace. Now, I wish that you would get it. I wish that you would just see it. And he's just weeping. He says, it's too late. The peace, is, it's been hidden from your eyes. You, you can't see it anymore. And, and then he goes into like, what's gonna happen? He says, before long, your enemies will build ramparts against your walls. They'll encircle you and they'll, They'll close in on you from, from every side. And they're gonna crush you into the ground and they're gonna take your children with you. And your enemies, they're not gonna leave a single stone in place. And then he says the reason why. Because you did not recognize it when God visited you. You didn't see it. You didn't recognize it when God visited you. Man, it's so important to recognize and to be able to see. And I hope that, that we begin to, to see what Jesus sees as he stands at, and, and looks out over the city and weeps over this city. I think as, as Christians, we've been talking about through this message series, we've been talking about the importance of, uh, of God's love for us that we have a God that is a down-to-earth God, right? And that he loves each and every one of you. And then when we start to understand God's love, like relationships aren't just one way, right? Like we can't just only be in a relationship where love is one way. So we have to start initiating conversations with God and with ourselves of like, all right, what does my love look like for God? And, and, and how am I living my life? And how am I loving God? And am I living the way that God has designed life to be lived? Am I living according to his word? Because God has a design, he has an order. His word communicates his design. And then am I in a place, am I in a position where I'm putting everything on the table, my preferences, my opinions, everything, on the table to say, God, what do you want? What do you want? How do you want me to live? And, and we start living by God's design. And as Christians and as Christ followers, we start living lives of principle. And we believe in the Bible and we put biblical principle in our lives. And then we live in this certain way. But we also recognize that not everybody lives that way. Not everybody wants to live that way. Not everybody wants to do life the way that I believe God wants me to do life. And so just naturally, we start identifying that there are sides. I'm on this side over here, and there's, a, there's some people over here on this side. And, and what I think is, is right, there's people that disagree and on this side, and I'm over here living my life on this side by conviction and by principle, and, and then I see people on the other side. When Jesus wept for that city, he was only days away from being in the city. And when he was in the city, he was rejected. And every one of them, including his closest and, and disciples, deserted him. Jesus on one side. And the other side was full of people that mocked him, that taunted him, that, that began to beat him and torture him, eventually crucifying and killing him. Talk about sides. But yet we find Jesus in this position where Jesus is weeping for them. And he's not weeping because of the pain that he's gonna experience. He's not weeping for the pain that he's gonna encounter in his life. No, he's weeping because of the pain that they're gonna experience. He's weeping for them because they don't understand the way to the peace. They don't understand the way to peace. And sometimes I, I find myself in a situation on sides and I, I can see the other side and I can 
I can be filled with disgust and lack of love for people that don't see the way I see, for people that are different than me, that vote differently than me, that have different views and different opinions and different preferences. And I can, I can be disgusted or I can have a, a lack of love for them. If we're gonna see the way that Jesus sees, first thing we need to do is we need to see the enemy clearly. Now, I grew up in church. I grew up in Sunday school. And there's a whole lot of things about, about being in the Lord's army. I mean, you remember this, right? I mean, we, I've been preaching on kind of God's design. I've been preaching on having convictions and, and living by and being engaged and being people of principle, right, and biblical values. And, and I mean, I grew up in church, and I, I know that there's a battle to fight. I mean, we are, how many of you know the Lord's army? I may never march in, come on, the tree, ride in the cavalry, shoot the artillery, come on. I may never That was like a C plus. I'm just gonna be honest with you guys. That wasn't very good. That wasn't very loud. I think you were timid. It's been a long time. But listen, we, we, we kind of get this mentality. We're in an army here. I'm a soldier of Christ. And I live by conviction. And I live strong on biblical principle. Ephesians 6 even tells us we gotta put on God's armor, right? We gotta suit up for battle. Let's read the rest. Put on all of God's armor so that you'll be able to stand firm against the strategies of the devil. It doesn't say of the people. It says of the devil. Because we're not fighting against flesh and blood. Who's flesh and blood? People. We're not fighting against flesh and blood. No, no, no. We're, we're fighting against evil rulers and authorities of the unseen world. This is a spiritual battle. We're fighting against the mighty powers in this dark world and against evil spirits in the heavenly places. We're engaged in a spiritual battle, yet often we put a target on people. We're not fighting people. Second Corinthians chapter 10, it says, for though we walk in the flesh, like, hey, we're people, we're people of flesh, but we're not waging war according to flesh. The weapons of our warfare, they're not of the flesh, but they have divine power to destroy strongholds. Because here's the reality. The enemy has a stronghold on people. And yet we can show up and start firing off shots at the hostage. We can show up with a target on people and we start firing off rounds towards the hostage. And the enemy has a stronghold on people. And that would be silly, right? You, you, you show up and you start, you, sh you start getting disgusted and have a lack of love for the people, the very people that are in bondage, the very people that are held hostage. Back to Luke chapter 19. Jesus is saying, man, I just wish that you of all people would understand the way to peace, but it's hidden. It's just hidden from your eyes. You just, you don't see it. You can't, you can't, see it. And that's why Jesus could hang on that cross after being rejected and tortured and beaten and mocked and crucified. And he hangs on that cross. He says, Father, forgive them. So they don't know what they're doing. They don't know what they're doing. Forgive them. As a parent, I, I, I know that for you parents out there, and it's, it's pretty important for us that as parents, one of our jobs is to diffuse the lies that our kids want to believe, right? Because right now it's candy season, all right? And there's, there's plenty of candy to go around and, and our kids love candy. I don't know about you, my kids love candy. And if it was up to them, 
I mean, it tastes good, it feels good, it feels right, and they're just like down in the candy until I stop them and say, whoa, what you don't know is that might seem right, but there's some things that's gonna happen to you if you only eat candy, right? And maybe some of you, that's news to you, all right? There's some things with your sugar levels. There's some, there's some things with your health. There's some things with your teeth. And let me tell you, it's in your best interest if you slow down the candy intake, all right? And it's my job as a parent to kind of help my kid, even though they might not see it, I get to help them understand it. I get to help them walk through that. And it's just, it's just like life. There's lies that I mean, it seems right, it might be right, but truth has something different to say. And, and wouldn't it be crazy if I let my kids' temptation towards candy, my kids' desire for candy, wouldn't it be crazy if I let that influence the way that I feel about my kids? Wouldn't that be crazy? That I would be disgusted with my kid because he just loves when he puts the Reese's in the refrigerator and then wants more and then wants another and then wants another, right? Hey, you don't know. They don't know. They don't get it. They don't see. Not only do we need to see the enemy clearly, we need to see the people clearly. We, we need to see the enemy as who the enemy is. We don't have a target on people, but we need to see the people clearly. I love the song, Amazing Grace, how sweet, I won't make you sing it uh, because I know how that's gonna go. Uh, <laughs> Amazing Grace, how sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. Man, and that's me. Man, I, I, I'm not any better than anybody else. I'm just better off, I'm just forgiven but that doesn't make me better. I, I, amazing grace, how sweet the sound that, that saved a wretch like me because I once was lost, but now I'm found. I once was blind, but now I see. The reality is, and even scripture tells us that, that there's a blindness, that, like a veil that covers our eyes. And, and if you can't see no wonder you're lost, right? No wonder you're wandering because we're all searching for the peace. We're all searching for what we can only find in Jesus and we're looking everywhere for it. We're looking in money, we're looking in partying, we're looking in love, we're looking everywhere for the peace that only can come through Jesus. But if you can't see, it's pretty hard to navigate. Second Corinthians chapter three says, the people's minds, they're hardened. And, and to this day, even when the, the scripture, the old covenant is being read, there's this veil that covers their minds and they can't understand the truth. And this veil can be removed only by believing in Christ. Continues, yes, even today when, when they read Moses' writings, the scriptures, and their hearts are covered with that veil. It says their minds are covered, their hearts are covered, and, and they don't understand. But whenever someone turns to the Lord, the veil is taken away. Here's what I, I don't want to see happen with, with me, with us, is that we get so passionate about our convictions. We, we get so passionate about our biblical principle. And, and you remember last week, man, I, I, I'm trying to engage the Christians. I'm trying to get Christians not to be passive and, and not to sit on our hands, right? Because if we sit on our hands, all the godly people sit on their hands, all the godly people just are inactive and they, they don't engage, then the only people that are left are the, the, the godless people, the ones who can't see, the, the ones who are navigating their way. But, but if, if they haven't yet turn to God, then they haven't quite been able to see. The veil hasn't fallen off yet. And so what I wanna make sure that we understand is this point here is that if we let our convictions overtake our compassion, we will engage in the wrong battle. I want you to have strong convictions, 
But if we let our convictions overtake our compassion, we're gonna fight the wrong thing. We're gonna put a target on somebody. We're gonna start taking out hostages. We're gonna start not seeing the way that Jesus sees when he looks over the city, the same city that's about to beat him and mock him and reject him and stand on the other side of him and oppose him. About to crucify him. And yet he doesn't weep for his own pain, he weeps for their pain. There's only two kinds of people in the world, those who are lost, those who are searching, those who are wandering, and those who are weeping for the lost. Because 1 Peter 5, 8 says, stay alert, watch out for the great enemy, the devil, because he prowls around like a roaring lion looking for someone to devour. Man, we've got people getting eaten alive. Let's not be a church that's disgusted with them. Let's not be a church that, that has a lack of love towards people that, that are just outside of covering and they're out there wandering around and the enemy is taking them and just eating them alive and holding them hostage and has a stronghold on them. And though we are so passionate about our convictions and though we are so strong in our beliefs and what we, what we know to be right and what we know to be true, there's only those who are lost and there are those who weep for the lost. And the reason that we weep for the lost like Jesus is because we see the hope clearly. We see the hope clearly. And we see the enemy clearly. We see people clearly. And if we're gonna see what Jesus sees, we see the hope clearly. I, mean, I, I love this country that we live in. I, I love America. I love the United States of America. And I think it's the greatest country in the world. I really do, and I am so thankful that I get to live here. And I love Ohio, and I love America, all right? I love this country, and I love, and I'm so thankful for the men and the women who have died for this country. The men and the women who have served this great nation. And I love, I love this country. But America is, is not my God. America is not where my hope is. My, my hope is not in America. See, and, and the great thing is that, that I don't have to wait for the government to get things all sorted out, to get things figured out before I know what it's like to live in the land of the free. I know what it's like to live with freedom. I, I don't need to wait for the government to get it all figured out for me to know what freedom is like. You don't, you don't need to wait to know what freedom is like, to know what peace is like, is you don't have to live all balled up inside, all knotted up inside, like a battle is raging on the inside and you can be free from that and you can be free from, from the pressure and the weight that is on you, the, the weight and the separation that sin causes. Like there is freedom available and it has nothing to do with the nation of where you live. Because my hope is not in America. My hope is in God. My hope is in Jesus. Just a few days after Jesus was weeping over the city, he gathers his friends together and they're all in this room and, and, and they're celebrating Passover and they have this Passover meal and, and Jesus gets his friends together and we, we know and reference it as as the Last Supper, because he draws them together and it's in Luke chapter 22. It's only just a, a few chapters after where we were in Luke 19 where, where he sees the city and he weeps for the city. And in Luke 22, we find this verse that, that he took some bread and he gave thanks to God for it. And then he began doing this, this, this action where he just started breaking this bread apart. He just began tearing it into pieces. And 
giving it to his disciples, giving it to his followers. And he said, this is my body. He's given us an illustration about what's gonna happen to him. He just starts breaking it apart, passing it around. This is my body. And I, I hope that you see how spiritual the issues are that we face today. Because there are, there are spiritual issues and, and you can see it. If you can see, you can see so clearly. Because there's issues that, that mock the design that God has in order. There's issues that we face today that, that mock God's design. And it's so spiritual. And there's people that, that innocently and they don't know but you've probably heard it in the media. You've probably heard it in arguments. And it's these words, this is my body. This is my body and I'll do what I want. This is my body. Don't tell me what to do with my body. Yet we see Jesus saying, this is my body. It's given for you. Do this. Do this in remembrance of me. It was after supper then he he took another cup of wine and he said, and this is the cup. This is, he's giving another illustration. He's saying this is the cup that represents this new covenant between God and his people. It's this agreement confirmed with my blood, which is poured out as a sacrifice for you. The hope that we have is not because we live by principle. It's not because we're moral people. It's not because we, we vote a certain way. It's not because our country is great. Man, the hope that we have is that we have a God that said, this is my body and I'm gonna give it to you. This is my blood and I want it to be a sacrifice for you so that you can be made right. It doesn't, it doesn't make me better, it makes me forgiven. And then I, I live with this, this commandment that Jesus gives us in John 13. He says, listen, I just, I just want you to love one another like I love you. I, I just want you to love other people the way that I love you. Just as I have loved you, you are also to love one another. We describe God's love as this unconditional love. We describe God's love as a love that's unconditional. You know what that means? It's a love that's not based on conditions. You don't have to meet a, a requirement or meet a condition or have a certain belief or have a certain view to experience the love of God. You don't have to be a certain way to experience an unconditional love. And then he calls us, his followers, people of conviction and people of principle and people that live by God's values and God's design to love the way he loves. An unconditional love, not disgust, not a lack of love, but a love that's based on no conditions. Let me pray for us. Heavenly Father, today, we wanna make sure that as, as we navigate these days as followers of Jesus, that, that we do live by principle and that we live and, and surrender to you and your ways, Lord. That may we not see people as our enemy, but may we have a full realization of the way that, that you love us. And Lord, today, I, 
I believe that there are people in this room today that, that need to take a step to you today. I believe that there are people that, that are wandering, that are searching, that maybe have not turned to you yet, or, yet, or they need to turn yet again back to you to experience the peace that you died to give, the freedom that you died to give. So with heads bowed and eyes closed, nobody's looking around today. I just wanna create an opportunity for you to make a decision for Jesus today, to, to take a step into that unconditional love that it doesn't matter what you've done, where you've come from, what you believe. Let's just start fresh today and find forgiveness in Jesus and find the peace that he wept for, that he died for. You would experience the way to peace and that is to Jesus. If anybody wants to make a move towards Jesus, say, would you just put your hand up? Maybe it's your first time, maybe it's a second time, maybe it's just again, but this is a call upon salvation, of forgiveness of sin, forgiveness of, of past. I see it, come on, I see it, I see it. I see your hand up. Heavenly Father, as those hands go up, may that be a confession to you that just says, I need the blood of Jesus to cover me. I need the blood of Jesus to, to cover my sins. Lord, so that, that when I do partake uh, of the bread and, and the wine, Lord, that I just, I am right with you. Lord, and I have been wrong in so many ways, but through your grace, I am made clean. We love you, Lord.